Now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Neil Deswani is an instructor and co-director for the Stanford Advanced Computer Security Certificate. In the past, he has served in a variety of research, development, teaching, and managerial roles at Twitter, Dacian, Google, and Stanford University. Neil is also a co-author of Foundations of Security, What Every Programmer Needs to Know, and has published extensively in these areas, having been quoted by publications such as the New York Times, USA Today, and CSO Magazine. Neil earned his PhD and MS degrees in computer science at Stanford, and he holds a BS in computer science with honors from Columbia. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Neil. Great, thank you very much for that introduction, Joe. Uh, in addition to the companies that you've mentioned, I've also uh, served in managerial roles in the area of security, both at uh, LifeLock and Semantic. And I'm um, thrilled to be uh, chatting with all of you today about some of the uh, big name breaches that have taken place over the past few years. You know, if we look at what's gone on in the uh, field for the past 15 years, there have been more than a billion customer records that have been stolen. Uh, there have been thousands upon thousands of breaches uh, that have impacted many organizations. And so there's uh, a lot to be learned uh, from, from these breaches. Uh, one of the reasons that I think it's important to make sure we cover these kinds of lessons and, then, and that, that we can all learn from these lessons is because, you know, there's a, this uh, adage that, uh, you know, those who don't know history are, are doomed to repeat it. And I think even when you, you know all the lessons, we look at, uh, you know, various world leaders, they are they're very aware of history and still it, it's, uh, it can be challenging to keep uh, oneself uh, out of trouble. So given what's taken place in the industry, uh, there's a lot to be learned. Uh, there's lots of organizations that have uh, been victimized by significant breaches. And the ones that we highlight here are uh, you know, not ones that we're talking about to, to, to shame any of them, but rather I think as a community of enterprises, uh, we, need to, we need to all uh, uh, you know, get better and be on a path of continual improvement uh, with regard to security so that we can uh, combat uh, some of the uh, adversaries, whether they be organized cybercriminal groups or uh, potentially even uh, nation states. So let's go ahead and start by covering a few of the breaches that have just occurred in the first five months of this year. And I'm going to cover not only two breaches, but one incident uh, that it may not be considered a breach, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is. But if we just look at the first five months of 2017, uh, there have been over 243 breaches as per data from uh, the breach database at privacyrights.org. And overall, the, the, the MO or the modus operandi for, for some of these breaches has been similar to what they have been, I'd say, over the past uh, four to five years. This diagram here on the left talks about the attacker life cycle, and I'll cover that in a bit more detail. Let me chat a little bit about some of the uh, more recent breaches. One of the organizations that was uh, impacted by a breach earlier this year uh, is uh, Dun & Bradstreet. Um, some of you may have heard of Dun & Bradstreet. They're an organization that tracks information about businesses, uh, mostly for the purpose of helping other organizations assess the credit creditworthiness of those uh, of those businesses. Uh, they also happen to have uh, databases of, you know, large numbers of individuals in corporate America, from CEOs to uh, executive vice presidents, to senior vice presidents, to uh, managers um, across organizations. And one of the issues that occurred earlier this year in March is that uh, it appears that their database of individuals in corporate America was, was stolen. Now, Dun & Bradstreet as a company sells that database to a number of other organizations, and it, uh, from statements that Dun & Bradstreet has made, they don't believe it was their information security uh, countermeasures that were breached, but they sell this data to a whole bunch of other organizations, and they believe that it was actually one of the other organizations, uh, one of the customers that were, that were breached. And so one of the things that we'll see in some of the other big name breaches that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, is that 
vetting your, your third-party suppliers has become more and more important. Uh, we'll talk about that in relation to, for instance, the, the target breach uh, in a few minutes. Um, but what's interesting about the Dun & Bradstreet breach is that it may have been the security of one of their customers that was breached. And so typically, you know, when you buy something from a company, you think about, okay, you need to vet their information security practices. You typically don't think about it the other way around, where when somebody buys something from you, you have to worry about their information security practices. But this is an example where uh, if you're selling data about uh, your customers or other individuals to other companies, well, maybe, maybe one might need to look the other way around. So that was the Dun & Bradstreet breach. Uh, let me chat a little bit next about the River City Media breach. So River City Media is uh, an email marketing company, and earlier this year they had a list of about 1.3 billion customer, uh, well, not customer, but uh, 1.3 billion names and email addresses that they would typically market to. And that data effectively was uh, breached and effectively inadvertently released out onto the internet because they had uh, they were using a Unix tool called rsync to back up their database of email addresses and that there was a configuration problem with that rsync process where it was uh, set up so that it inadvertently uh, allowed the information to be viewable by anybody on the internet uh, so that was a uh, second breach that occurred this year. Uh, the third uh, issue that I want to talk about, incident that I want to talk about that occurred this year, is the uh, WannaCry uh, incident. So, so, so WannaCry is the short form of a name of uh, a piece of malware, malicious software, uh, that would, once it infects somebody's machine, it would, in, it would basically encrypt files on the hard drive or the local storage of the machine that was infected, uh, it's a piece of ransomware. So once, uh, once that uh, data got encrypted using a key that's only known to the attacker, the attacker would then ask the um, individual or the company that was affected to pay a ransom of, I believe it was about $300, it was a few hundred dollars, uh, if they want to have their files decrypted. So the, the WannaCry incident had affected over 200,000 uh, machines across the uh, internet and, and the reason that I say that I was say an incident as opposed to a breach is that typically in a breach there's an exfiltration um, of the, the data in an unencrypted way. In, in this case when WannaCry or another piece of ransomware infects the machine it uh, encrypts the data and keeps it local to the machine that's infected and it doesn't necessarily need to get infiltrated and so that that may or may not qualify as a, as a breach. Uh, it, it certainly qualifies as a compromise, um, but you know, if you look at the, the various uh, you know, state breach laws, and I'll just mention up front, I'm not an attorney, it may or may not qualify uh, as, a, as, as a breach. But it's certainly uh, an interesting incident. The reason that, that the WannaCry ransomware was able to propagate and affect so many um, machines on the internet was because it took advantage of a vulnerability in a uh, distributed file protocol, the SMB protocol uh, on Windows. And what, what was interesting about this is that the vulnerability that was used, uh, there was a patch made available in mid-March. And so if one simply patched uh, before it hit in May, then one of the machines should not be affected. Um, but it just emphasizes how important uh, regular patching is. So, so those are three uh, breaches slash incidents that occurred just, uh, just this year. Now, these, you know, if you look at some of these numbers, if you look at the River City media breach, it has a, a very significant number, 1.34 billion. Uh, it was mostly names and email addresses. There have been larger breaches that have been taking place, that have taken place over the years and, and more significant breaches in the way of the information that was stolen. So let me go ahead and chat a little bit about some of those breaches as well. Um, before I go on to talking about specific breaches, and we'll, we'll, we'll start with the, the Yahoo breach in just a second, I just want to double click into the diagram that I had on the previous slide a little bit more. This diagram shows typic the typical attacker lifecycle. So, you know, very often 
we can end up focusing on our work and what's convenient and what we need to do to get our jobs done, but attackers, whether they're cyber criminals, whether they're nation state attackers, they have a different view of the world. And there's been a number of these types of diagrams that have been produced over the, the past few years. This particular one uh, is, um, is, is available on Wikipedia. But it shows that there's a cycle that attackers follow, where they first define what their target is, and then they effectively take a mission-based approach to going about achieving their goals. This is very different than the way that attackers used to operate 10 or 15 years ago, where very often somebody would write a worm or a virus and deploy it out into the internet, and their goal was to just make a name for themselves. Uh, that's typically not the case anymore. The, the attackers, um, you know, what, even when they make an initial compromise, they don't disclose it to the world. Even if they can deface your homepage, they don't do that right away. They will look at the initial compromise as a first step in their attack, and they'll figure out what else they can do. And so once they've defined their target, they will figure out, hey, are there other cyber criminal groups that they want to uh, work together with. They may build uh, or acquire tools to target particular organizations. They may develop custom malware. They may uh, un they may understand a little bit about how the organization works and how to how to target their particular countermeasures. Uh, they will research their targets, whether their targets be executives at the company, whether their targets are system administrators at a company. They'll spend time on social networks to understand who are the people they should target, what are their roles. Uh, if there's an important executive and maybe they think the executive might not fall for the attack, who is their administrative assistant? Uh, how can they try to dupe the administrative assistant into clicking on the wrong thing, for instance? Uh, once they develop their tools, they'll, they'll test for detection, they'll deploy, uh, they'll make some initial intrusion, they'll infect the machine, they'll get credentials to some particular account. Uh, and then they will, you know, continue their attack. Once they establish a footprint of a compromised machine, say, they will initiate an outbound connection so that they can persistently control that machine on an ongoing basis and use it as a, as a, as a beachhead to do additional uh, reconnaissance and scanning to see, well, what other machines can they infect? What other information can they get access to? And they'll pretty much continue this process over months or years until they accomplish their mission, whether their mission is to steal intellectual property, steal identities, steal trade secrets, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. One of the things that this, um, that this uh, diagram shows kind of in the center is that not all attackers are equal. There are some very determined attackers that will put in that kind of effort, and they're typically referred to as advanced persistent threats. And so you'll see, as denoted by the purple, that attackers that are in that category will carry out all of the steps in this particular attack life cycle diagram. At the same time, there might be, uh, say, lower tier cyber criminal groups. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't call them, uh, you know, uh, lower tier in uh, their methods of attack, but I'd call them lower tier in, say, the amount of resources that they have as compared to a nation state. Uh, and they may, in order to accomplish their goals and their mission, if they simply want to monetize a bunch of machines that they infect uh, and have them participate in a botnet and rent out those compromised machines to others, they may not need to pursue all of the steps in this particular diagram. So if you look at uh, the orange, for instance, you'll see that they may build a required tool. They may test for detection. They'll deploy. Um, but they, they, they may not spend as much time researching via social media all of the, you know, employees uh, or individuals in an organization that they want to target. So, so this is the, the typical attack, attacker life cycle. And as I talk about some of these large breaches, uh, you'll, you'll see me describe um, some of the different parts of this in talking about the attacks. So with that, let's, uh, let's talk about the, the first um, uh, breach or set of breaches. I'm going to chat about the breach that occurred against Yahoo uh, that was discovered in 2016. And so there's an asterisk up, up to the top right of 2016 because that's when the attack was discovered. The breaches actually took place in 2013 and 2014. There were actually two distinct breaches. They disclosed uh, one breach of over 500 million user records and then another uh, follow-on breach of a billion plus user records uh, and you know if um, and, and so just for convenience I will talk about 
those breaches, uh, you know, together as one, even they were even though they were two distinct breaches. Um, if I if we look at what information was was stolen in those user records, it included, you know, not just names and email addresses, but it included telephone numbers. It included the security questions and answers that one typically sets up when you set up a web-based account, uh, such that even if somebody didn't have your password, they could try to use the answers to those questions to gain access to your account. Uh, the stolen information included uh, dates of birth as well as uh, hashed passwords. Um, that said, uh, due to the, the, the scope of the breach that occurred, uh, what the attackers were able to do is get access to actually all billion plus Yahoo accounts and they were able to log in to any of those accounts at will without a password. How did they do that? I'll talk about that in just a second. So, this breach uh, was the largest breach that occurred in the history of the Internet. Um, Yahoo was in the midst of getting acquired by Verizon Communications at the time that the breach was discovered. And it was a breach that was material enough. Uh, they were getting acquired, I think, for $4 billion plus, uh, probably uh, close to $5 billion. And upon disclosure of the breach, uh, given that it was material, uh, Verizon dropped the price of the acquisition by $350 million, which uh, is pretty, inex pretty expensive in and of itself, uh, not including all the costs that uh, Yahoo probably had to incur to do forensics and investigations and uh, pay an attorney's fees and whatnot. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very significant breach, uh, probably the most significant breach of, of all time thus far and uh, resulted in, uh, you know, issues to, uh, to Yahoo's valuation. Um, so th 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 those were some of the impacts, but there are a number of other impacts as well. Um, you know, given that attackers, uh, and by the way, the, the attackers that conducted this attack were made up of two Russian spies and two cyber criminals, and uh, you know, one of the one of the kind of interesting documents that I that I that I read, uh, of course, in preparation for this webinar, was the indictment of those uh, individuals. Uh, there's a reference to it at the end of the talk, but the attack was significant not only for these you know financial reasons, but the attackers, given that they could um, you know log into pretty much anybody's Yahoo account, they started targeting uh, diplomats. They started targeting. Uh, particular executives, they just went after about 6,500 very targeted uh, folks. Um, given, of course, that, that the, the list of all of these records were stolen, one could use them to do mass uh, phishing attacks, um, but uh, there's um, you know, many other things that could have uh, taken place. The, the, the attackers um, used a combination of spear phishing and malware to get in. In fact, their attack was significant enough that they were able to uh, infect uh, Yahoo search engine so they could return whatever links that they wanted at will. And so in addition to the attacks that they conducted, they um, set up a bunch of affiliate deals and started serving links on Yahoo search engine and uh, monetizing the, the traffic uh, from people clicking on those links. So, so that, that's a pretty significant impact. How did that, how did that occur? So, um, you know, the FBI pretty much traced the beginning of this attack to a, uh, a phishing attack, uh, in particular to a spear phishing attack. So for those of you that are familiar with phishing, you know that even going back 10 years, there would be many attackers that would send out emails that would claim to be some, from some bank and they would uh, hope that when they sent you that email that you have an account at that bank and that you'll click on the link and you'll go to the imposter webpage that they set up and enter your username and password for your bank. Uh, and, you know, the attacker's site would just return some errors saying, oh, you know, your login didn't work, please try again later. But what the attacker would do with those stolen credentials then is then go log into your bank and try to transfer money out of it. And those were kind of the initial uh, spate of uh, phishing attacks. But over time, attackers developed more sophistication so that they started doing spear phishing attacks where the attacks were, say, not necessarily targeted at consumers broadly, but they were targeted at individuals and corporations. And the goal was to get particular individuals to give up their credentials for uh, 
certain corporate accounts and for corporate systems. So why bother trying to uh, look for vulnerabilities and try to break into a whole bunch of machines if you can just email uh, an employee and get them to give you their credentials? Uh, and so, so the attack against Yahoo, in fact, started with spear phishing against not an executive and you know not random employees, but uh, a particular employee and set of employees that were semi-privileged, that happened to have access to certain uh, systems at Yahoo. Uh, some of the key systems that mattered were Yahoo's user database um, and Yahoo's uh, tool that they used for account management. Um, there was also an, uh, another tool that was used to, to generate cookies. And so let me, let me just finish talking a little bit about spear phishing and, and malware, and then I'll chat a little bit about uh, how, the, how the cookie theft occurred and, and how that allowed attackers to access all, all Yahoo email accounts. So, uh, you know, spear phishing attacks, they very often are seeking to steal a set of user credentials and employee credentials, but in addition, given that drive-by downloads can occur where to, to infect a machine these days, you don't need to even dupe a user into clicking yes or downloading something and double-clicking on it to run. Um, you, can, you can simply, if you can send over an email where you can dupe somebody into just clicking on a link, then upon the victim clicking on the link, they will get infected just by opening the web page. And the way that happens is by uh, drive-by download where the infected web page will uh, fingerprint what browser is the victim running, what are all the different third-party plugins that the victim is running, and within a couple hundred milliseconds, the attacker's exploit toolkit on the infected web page figures out uh, what vulnerable versions of software are running and simply does a lookup in an online database to figure out what's the piece of malicious code that they need to send down to exploit that vulnerability, infect the machine, and take it over. And so, so spear phishing attacks often also contain these links to drive-by downloads. So, uh, so, so, so the attacks against Yahoo started with spear phishing and, and, and malware that was used to, to infect machines, and the attacker was able to get access to these, um, to these Yahoo systems. I mentioned that one of the systems was a, a tool that allows a, a, the, the attacker to effectively mint cookies. So, so for those of you that, that um, you know, know how most websites work, right, if, if there's a website which requires a login, you um, present the user with a username and password field and have them type in the username and password. And then once their username and password checks out, you give them back a cookie. A server will give back a cookie to the user's browser. And after that interaction, it's that cookie that keeps going back and forth between the website uh, and the user's browser. And that cookie actually authenticates the user so that the user doesn't have to enter their username and password on every single web page. And so, well, if, if you're an attacker and you can figure out how a website creates its cookies, then you actually don't need anybody's passwords to log in. You can just forge cookies and log into the website and go from there. And that's exactly what happened in the, in the Yahoo attack, and that's how the attackers were able to access all uh, Yahoo email accounts uh, at will without passwords. So that's the Yahoo breach, uh, and that was discovered in 2016. I'm going to talk about a couple other breaches that were discovered in 2015 and 2014, and then I'm going to chat a little bit about some defenses against malware and phishing. But one thing that you'll see is that in a lot of these big name breaches, phishing and malware have been the tools of choice that attackers have been using. So let me chat about um, the uh, next breach, uh, the Office of Personnel Management breach from 2015. Uh, the Office of Personnel Management is a uh, government agency that has uh, or had or still has uh, all the uh, background check records. So anytime that you apply to be a government employee and or have to go through a security clearance, there's a form called uh, SF-86, Standard Form 86, and it not only contains, as you might imagine, all the previous addresses that you used to live and all the places that you used to work and whatnot, but it has that information for all of your family members. Uh, and what got stolen during the Office of Personnel Management breach in 2015 was all of those, all of those records. Um, it also included, by the way, 5.6 million fingerprint records. And so what was the impact of that attack? You know, if you, if you read the uh, House uh, Oversight Committee's 
uh, majority staff report on this on this breach. Um, you know, a direct quote from there in terms of what the impact was is that it will harm counterintelligence efforts for at least a generation to come. The value of the stolen background information for a foreign nation cannot be overstated, nor will it ever be fully known. That's, um, you know, quite significant. The damage has already been done. Um, it's a significant blow to, uh, to the country's uh, intelligence uh, efforts and counterintelligence efforts. Uh, how did it happen? You know, overall, the information security program at the Office of Personnel Management was, was under-resourced, and the amount of priority that was given to uh, security uh, was, was, was not enough. Um, the uh, U.S. Uh, computer Emergency Response Team um, had actually identified that there was an exfiltration from the Office of Personnel Management. It was kind of a part of breach one. They notified the Office of Personnel Management uh, and basically a, a set of teams were set up to monitor the first breach uh, and then there was a second breach. But basically uh, it was a, you know, even after that first breach occurred, it was discovered that there was uh, malware on a number of key um, machines, um, including, I believe, a, a jump box. A jump box is typically a machine that's in between one's, you know, development and test and staging networks and one's production network. And that machine that was infected um, was seen to be running uh, a process, a dynamically linked library that um, had a particular name that was actually um, you know, indicative of uh, McAfee uh, security software. Um, unfortunately, though, the OPM was not a McAfee customer. And so that was simply a, a piece of malware and a name being used to masquerade the attacker's uh, toolkit that were using a rootkit called uh, HiKit. Uh, they were using two variants, A and B. And uh, that malware was used to uh, uh, purportedly um, monitor uh, accounts um, and, you know, steal more information. So um, the program there what was under-resourced and there was a, a sequence of breaches. Um, one of the things that could have been done to present, prevent this breach was to use uh, multi-factor authentication, to use two-factor authentication so that, you know, even if uh, say some machines got infected and even if some account credentials got stolen from there, um, you know, if you require more than just a username and password to access certain critical systems, um, then, you know, and there's say some two-factor code that gets sent to a person's mobile phone or whatnot, then the attacker would have had to infect, infect uh, not only a bunch of machines but also people's phones. So, so that could have, um, that could have potentially uh, helped. One of the challenges that the Office of Personal Management had is that they had a lot of legacy systems and uh, keep, keeping legacy systems patched uh, so that they can't be infected by malware can, can often be a challenge. So that's a little bit about the Office of Personal Management breach. Uh, going back a, a year, or actually also in 2015, let me also chat about the Anthem breach. Uh, Anthem provides healthcare services to a significant fraction of the country and in 2015 they had a breach where 80 million customer records were stolen. Uh, those records included people's names, their dates of birth, their social security numbers, their healthcare IDs, um, and there had been a, you know, more than a, a hundred lawsuits that occurred. Um, in this particular case, there was a uh, database user's credentials that were stolen, and the way the breach got noticed is that um, one of the administrators had noticed that there was a database query running that they didn't issue. And so the issue, I think, occurred, uh, the initial compromise might have happened in, say, April, but um, in December or January, you know, months later, this query was noticed to be running, and it was taking up a lot of system resources, and so once it was investigated uh, that, that the credentials were, were stolen, um, it set off the whole incident response process. Um, the, I, have a, I have a next slide here on how the Anthem breach happened uh, in, in more detail. Uh, and, you know, we'll return to how it could have been prevented in, in uh, just a bit. Basically, there are a couple steps. Uh, the attacker sent in a phishing email 
uh, with a link to uh, wellpoint.com. Uh, wellpoint spelled with two ones instead of two L's. Uh, the victim clicked on it. Um, the victim machine got infected just from the click. Malware was installed on the victim system. Uh, and then that system got, got monitored, right? Once, once an attacker owns a system, they can monitor all traffic that goes through it. And they were able to monitor for uh, account uh, credentials. Um, so uh, what happened from there is that the, the attacker stole the credentials and used those credentials to start posing queries against Anthem's databases. Uh, and then issued a query for this uh, 80 million uh, data set. And that's how, that, that's the point at which the attacker got discovered. So, uh, so that, that's the Anthem breach. Uh, I'll talk about just one or two more breaches. Uh, I'll talk about the JP Morgan Chase breach that happened in 2014. Uh, in this particular breach, what got stolen was 70 million customer names and email addresses. Uh, one of the things that was interesting about this breach, you could imagine that JP Morgan Chase as a, as a bank invests a lot in security. And, uh, you know, if there is, you know, this kind of information stolen, it can be used for mass potential phishing attacks. Of course, the, it's because the attacker stole the information from uh, this data set at JP Morgan Chase, they, they know that all the customers have JP Morgan Chase accounts. So, uh, so, so there is that, that mass for, there is that potential for mass phishing attacks, but given that it impacted a bank, you know, one of the silver linings here in this particular breach is that, you know, one could imagine that if it was worse, the attackers could have just directly stolen money out of people's accounts or uh, deleted information or just uh, took direct financial control, which, which didn't happen. So it's unfortunate that this attack occurred, but it could, have, it could have been a lot worse. How did this particular attack occur? Uh, again, there was a phishing email that was sent to steal some employee credentials. Uh, and then those employee credentials uh, were leveraged by the attacker. Now, J.P. Morgan Chase did have two-factor authentication deployed on many, many, many of their servers. Uh, unfortunately, there was one third-party server. There was a nonprofit that did some work for the for the for the bank. Uh, I, I I believe that they helped organize um, you know fundraisers, marathons, something like that. But basically, there was one server on which two-factor authentication was not deployed, and so the attacker was able to use the stolen username and password to get to uh, this data. Um, so what could have uh, prevented it? Well, anti-phishing training. Um, you know, if, a, if, a, if, a, if an employee, if employees can be better trained to recognize phishing attacks and or more quickly report them, the so much the better. And then of course, you gotta get two-factor on all servers. If you miss even one, attackers can take advantage of that. So that's the JP Morgan Chase breach. And finally, I'll talk about the target breach uh, in the target breach in 2013, what got stolen was 40 million credit card numbers. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that you can reset people's credit card numbers and uh, customers are typically not held accountable or liable. Um, but the way that, the way that this um, occurred uh, was actually initially via a third party supplier that Target used. They um, had a firm by the name of Fazio Mechanical Services that was responsible for running the air conditioning and heating at all of the retail branches. And uh, the attackers first broke into Fosium Mechanical Services and took advantage of the fact that their networks were connected together. And they started sending out uh, a whole bunch of malware-laden phishing emails. Um, and over a series of months, basically got to a point where they were able to, with malware, infect the point of sale stations that were in the retail stores. And they were able to start exfiltrating data out of those um, point of sale stations as customers would scan their cards. Uh, so, you know, in this particular case, uh, network segmentation could have helped if um, their air conditioning network access was segmented off from the rest of the company's access. That, that could have uh, helped deter the attackers further. Uh, and, you know, Target did have um, some anti-malware technology deployed. Um, they had uh, a set of folks uh, outsourced abroad that were kind of looking through all the alerts, um, and there were a significant number of alerts 
that indicated that there was a breach going on. There were malware infections taking place. Uh, some of those notifications were getting escalated up to their headquarters, um, but there were so many alerts that uh, they, 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 they couldn't and, and weren't able to respond to them. And, you know, there, there might have been enough false positive alerts, fake alarms effectively, that it was hard, it may have been hard to discern, well, what were the real alerts? Or where was the real malicious activity happening? So in any case, that surveys a whole bunch of the, the big name breaches that have taken place over the past four years. Uh, I'm going to, um, you know, talk about some of the key, key attack vectors and defenses. In all these attacks, in all these big name attacks, phishing and malware has been, have been used as tools of choice by the attackers. So I'm going to talk, talk about a bunch of uh, defenses. When it comes to phishing, I mentioned that, you know, one of the things that you can do is train your uh, employees, uh, give them awareness training for how to recognize phishing attacks. How do you recognize malicious domains? How do you uh, recognize malicious URLs? Um, and in many organizations, one good practice is to regularly try to phish your own employees, right? The security team sends out fake phishing emails. And, uh, sees what percentage of the employees fall for the fall for the test attack, um, and then continue, uh, you know, quarter over quarter, year over year, with um, helping the employee base just get better and better at recognizing such attacks. Um, one of the interesting things that can happen in, in those things is that when you train employees to recognize attacks and then have them start sending in uh, attacks. Uh, what, can, what can happen from time to time is we'll send in an email saying, ha, 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 you tried to get me uh, with, your, with your fake attack, but I caught you. And uh, sometimes the email response that comes back from the security team is, actually, that wasn't us. Um, that was a real attack. So, so thank you for being a human sensor to complement all of our technology to, to help us gather data on when we're getting attacked. Um, part of part of such training that is important is to recognize and, and to train employees to to report phishing attacks because when phishing attacks do occur, it's not necessarily game over. If some if some user did get duped into providing their username and password, but then reports it in, well, the security team can help reset those credentials so that the credentials that got stolen are ineffective. Or let's say that somebody's system got infected with malware. Uh, well, you can take steps to contain that malware and reimage the machine uh, and, and cut off the attack, but there's got to be that training. So, so fast reporting and credentials reset is important. Other technologies that can be important in making email more secure is leveraging technologies like uh, SPF and DKIM and DMARC. Um, that in, in SPF, you can declare, well, what are the, you know, you could imagine that attackers, if you're working for a company called foobar.com, attackers might want to spoof emails uh, coming from that domain so that it appears like it's coming from the organization. And by using technologies like SPF and uh, DKIM and DMARC and by signing all emails that go out from the organization and instructing the internet to, to drop such emails, um, you can uh, make it much, much harder for attackers to try to spoof your own domain and kind of force them to use other domains. And so then if users have the appropriate training to look out for spammy looking domains, it can, it can help. And then uh, another important defense is to uh, leverage multi-factor authentication so that even if attackers steal a particular user and password credential, that credential in and of itself cannot be used to access a critical system. Uh, and it requires uh, another two-factor code to come via uh, another out-of-band channel in order to provide access to a system. So that's phishing in some defenses. Um, and then there's, then there's malware. Uh, having important anti-malware defenses is, is very uh, important, and it's actually uh, important to go beyond just traditional antivirus, which might use signature-based techniques to recognize malware that's been already deployed. But you want to you defend against malware that hasn't been recognized yet. So uh, various uh, endpoint production products on the market will, in addition to using signatures, they'll use heuristics. They'll use machine learning. They'll leverage cloud intelligence from samples that have uh, come in from customers um, to to achieve a network effect and detection. Um, those are all those are all good defenses. In addition, when there is any piece of executable code that looks like it might be suspicious, uh, one can leverage what's called SAN-based 
sandbox-based detection, where that malware gets spun up into a virtual machine, um, and you test, well, what does that, what does that binary do? Um, so even if there's no signature for it, uh, and maybe if it sets off some heuristics, um, you see, well, what does it actually do when it gets and starts running on a machine? Uh, there's also intrusion detection technologies that could be used, uh, systems like Snort and Bro that are uh, well-known intrusion detection systems, which, which do take advantage of signatures, but basically gives you detection not just on the hosts themselves, but uh, at the network layer, at the firewall layer, at other parts of the network. And then one other thing that you can do is on machines uh, that could potentially get infected, limit the privileges that users are allowed to have on their machines. You can imagine that, um, that if you can limit privileges and say not let users install, software on their machines, then if, even if an attacker compromises that machine, they, they won't be able to install malicious software. So, so limiting the privileges can be important. Um, you know, I talked about the, the attack against Yahoo. Uh, so it is important if you run web applications to make sure that the cookies that your site generates are strong. Um, and very often what goes into cookies, uh, you know, they get generated based off of some secret key or some combination of a secret key plus a per user uh, nonce. Uh, and so it's important to protect those keys, have strong key management. And, you know, the, the, all of these topics are, are topics that we cover in a number of our, of our courses here, here at Stanford. Um, but let me, let me um, chat a little bit about uh, some defenses uh, more generally. You know, I've talked a lot about some of the big name breaches here. And phishing and malware has been a set of tools that attackers have used to accomplish these big name breaches. But, you know, most breaches, uh, in fact, occur due to uh, inadvertent mistakes made by employees or some set of humans. And so it's important to, you know, not just have anti-malware and anti-phishing defenses, but to have a set of defenses um, that one employs at, at an organization uh, to have a holistic defense and to have countermeasures that defend not only against the, the most uh, sophisticated cyber criminals and these kind of big name types of attacks, but also defend against all the inadvertent things that can, that can go wrong. And so uh, employing an approach where you have some countermeasures that uh, prevent uh, is a good thing. For instance, data minimization. If you don't need the data, don't store it. If you don't store it, it can't be stolen. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other prevention uh, approaches that I list here, but you've got to couple that together with good detection, good containment, and good recovery countermeasures. Um, how one reacts when there's issues uh, can be just as important as preventing issues in and of themselves um, is one of the things that I think has been learned over the years. Um, if you're an organization and you're working to uh, improve your security uh, and monitor your security, how can you do that? And how can you do that quantitatively? Um, so there's, an, there's a number of services these days that allow you to measure your security posture. Uh, and so Security Scorecard is a company uh, that's funded by Google Ventures. They provide one such service where they measure 10 different areas of your security. And for instance, they measure your endpoint security. They help identify if you do have infected machines on your network that might be participating in botnets, networks of compromised machines. And uh, they do that by monitoring uh, these bot networks and what IPs are connecting in them. And are any of those IP addresses yours? Um, but employing a service like this can help you get a sense for your overall security posture. Um, and, and can be very good in, in helping uh, help you figure out where you need to make improvements. Uh, one of the one of the challenges, of course, is that uh, you know such such things may not be fully comprehensive. For instance, uh, you know, are you using two-factor authentication? Um, are you doing phishing tests and anti-phishing training that that may or may not be directly uh, captured by by some of these. Uh, measurements in a number of these areas. You know, a typical security scorecard report, though, will have a lot of data, and it'll have some overview that, you know, gives you grades in these different areas and helps you monitor the data over time. Uh, this is a sample report for a fictional uh, organization called Evergrocery, um, but can be uh, helpful. You know, for instance, looking at patching cadence, uh, if, if uh, you have any machines that, um, you know, are not being patched regularly externally, then it could be susceptible to, to incidents like WannaCry. 
Um, so this kind of data can be helpful. Um, another um, such uh, tool that could be used is a tool called Quadmetrics that was acquired actually by uh, FICO, the, the same organization that monitors credit scores. And the reason I, I mentioned quad metrics is because they, they are also looking at what are many of these different uh, features and aspects that one can observe to assess external security posture. And, and I mention them because they have some published research back in 2015, uh, a number of the uh, early employees and founders, I believe, of the company uh, published a paper at uh, the USENIX 24th Security Symposium. And in their paper, they describe how they looked at 258 features uh, that one can just observe and uh, see if there's any mismanagement happening within organization security. Are there SSL certificates that are misconfigured? Uh, are some of the IPs that an organization owns involved in doing spam and phishing attacks? And they built a random forest predictive classifier um, so that they could predict uh, which organizations are most likely to get breached. And kind of without getting into the details, we cover this in our, uh, in more detail in our cyber um, security for executives course. Uh, they, they, they trained some of their models and then looked at, well, back in 2014, uh, could they predict which organizations might have get, gotten breached? And based on the way their classifier was trained, it came up with pretty high scores for some of the organizations that were breached. Now, of course, the real question is, if we, if we use this model today, who would they predict is going to get breached next year and the year after that? But it's really, it's really good to see the field getting more quantitative and bringing in more data to help assess security posture and help organizations improve their security. So with that, I'll just provide a couple pointers where you can learn more. I mentioned, uh, we, just, um, we just rolled out, I mentioned the Cybersecurity and Executive Strategy course. This is a course that we just rolled out that helps you uh, as, a, as, a, as a manager uh, or as an executive understand how do you measure security, how do you uh, report to the board, how do you report to other management. We have a course on emerging threats and defenses. Um, we also have a course on Software Security Foundation, so if you are just getting into the field and want to learn more, that's a great course to take. Uh, there's a bunch of other links here to uh, some resources on the various breaches that I talked about. Uh, for instance, a link to the indictment of the uh, Russian spies and cyber criminals. Um, in the case of the OPM breach, there's a link here to this House Oversight uh, Majority Staff Report. Uh, there's a link to a presentation by some folks from Anthem themselves about how that attack occurred. Uh, and with that, I hope, I hope you've enjoyed, uh, uh, you know, learning how these uh, big name breaches have occurred uh, and hope that you've enjoyed learning a little bit about some of the countermeasures that, that could help and how the breaches occurred so that uh, hopefully we can all learn from these lessons and uh, prevent some of these kinds of breaches from occurring in the future. Thank you. All right, so now we'll take a few minutes to answer some of your questions. Looks like the first one we have is, with breaches being a part of the mainstream media in the past few years, uh, particularly in politics, security has now become a much higher priority for my company. We have recently been approved for a significant budget increase next year and are discuss discussing proposed strategies. Uh, what areas do you think will provide the best investment? So uh, that is a question that will depend upon your organization and uh, what, uh, you know, who's targeting you, what's your attack surface. Um, and so to figure out what might be some of the best areas for investment, uh, what I'd suggest is as step one to do a risk assessment um, and uh, have interviews with your employees, um, have uh, you know, bring in a lot of uh, quantitative and qualitative data and uh, assess what the risks are and then figure out what are the countermeasures, whether it be people, process, technology, uh, that one should put in place to address those risks. So that's uh, the first question. Uh, let, me, um, let me take a stab at the next question. Uh, next question here is, uh, you know, can we define breach? Uh, I've heard this, use, this word used in different places, resulting in different meanings. For example, is a breach any data is compromised or when it only refers to meet a certain set of standards? And so uh, the question of what is the definition of breach is, a, is an interesting one. 
Um, I would actually encourage you to consult an attorney. Uh, there are data breach laws in, you know, 45, 47 plus of the states that uh, have them, and they all define breach a little bit differently. Um, the, the definition, you know, California was the first state that had such a data breach law back in 2003, but the, the laws generally are of the form that, you know, if there is unencrypted data that's stolen that contains, say, somebody's name plus a certain set of identifiers, whatever, uh, then, it counts as a, then it counts as a breach. And each state's definition is a little bit different, and there's that legal definition of, of breach. Uh, you know, sometimes I've, I've seen technical folks uh, throw around the word breach. So, for instance, like, uh, you know, let's say that malware infects some system. Well, if there's no, you know, customer or personally identifiable information, that may not be considered a breach. Uh, so, so that, you know, uh, so the answer is consult an attorney. An attorney will help you understand what's the legal definition of breach and, uh, you know, go from there. I think we have time for maybe one more, one more question. Um, and let's see, um, I can only choose, I guess, uh, uh, one. Um, let's see, uh, there's a question here of, uh, I have a question about the attacker lifecycle. How long could an attacker maintain connectivity with a victim in terms of duration? And, and the answer to that is that, um, you know, an attacker could, in theory, maintain connectivity indefinitely, right? until the connectivity is cut off by, for some reason, right? So um, the, the, you know, how, how long an attacker wants to maintain connectivity, um, how fast can an organization identify it and cut it off, those are all, those are all variables. Um, but there is nothing inherent about the attacker lifecycle that, you know, would limit how long an attacker can maintain connectivity. And so, you know, with attacks having uh, become more mission-based, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, attackers have been maintaining connectivity, you know, much longer than they have in the past. Uh, it, can, it can range on the order of months or years. Great. Well, great. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, looks like that's all the time we have left for this webinar. Thank you all for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.